Hi, happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 816th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Julia Tulovsky, Komar Melamed, Olga Zaikina, and Johnny Sagan. We are thrilled to welcome poet Eugene Ostashkevsky here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Julia Tulovsky is curator for Russian and Soviet nonconformist art at the Zimmerli Art Museum at Rutgers University, where she has organized more than 20 exhibitions. A specialist in Russian art, she has published broadly on Russian avant-garde and contemporary art in both Russian and English. Vitaly Komar and Alex Melamed were born in Moscow. In 1972, they founded Sots Art Con Conceptual Eclectic Art based on cliches of the Soviet propaganda and world's art history. In 1974, their works were destroyed by the Soviet authorities during the disbanded bulldozer exhibition. And in 1976, their works were smuggled to New York where they have work been working in and, and exhibiting since 1978. Olga Zaikina Condor is an art historian and curator whose research focuses on modern and contemporary art. She earned a PhD in 2022 from Pennsylvania State University. Her, in her dissertation, Art in the Late Soviet Apartment, she examined the role of domestic materiality and related everyday practices in Moscow conceptual art. Olga's work has been published in many notable journals. And our host today, Johnny Sagan, studies fine art and art history at Hunter College. He's an alumnus of the Hunter Painting Fellowship and the Mellon Public Humanities and Social Justice Scholars Program. He is currently working on two books, Hatching a Spirit, The Journey of the Moscow Conceptualists, and A Seismograph of the Soul, Art as a Spiritual Practice. Thank you all so much for joining today, and I'll turn it over to you, Johnny. Hi. Uh, am I, am I, is this thing on? Yes. Hello. So I'm so glad that we have Vitaly and Alex here, Komar and Melamed, because these are legends. These are very unique artists, and it's wonderful that they have a huge and high, very detailed retrospective at the Zimmerly Museum at Rutgers University right now that we can go and see. And it's, of course, an especially interesting moment to go look at the legacy of Moscow conceptualism because history seems to be repeating itself uh, in tragic and tragicomic ways right now. And I think the Moscow conceptualists have a lot to show us about how to survive dark times by uh, sort of taking refuge in the various powers of art against the principalities of the world uh, who may be making life difficult for us. Um, an exciting time, yeah, Komar and Melamed are gonna have a lot to say about this. It's, a, it's an exciting time because at Hunter, we are actually preparing an exhibit of second generation conceptualists who, many of whom were mentored by Komar and Melamed, which is gonna open at the Hunter Galleries in September. So it's just a really interesting time to reflect on the Moscow conceptualist legacy. Um, I wanna begin by having Alex and Vitaly say hello. So can you two say hello to the group that is gathering? Vitaly Komar is in his studio um, and Alex is in his. And it's wonderful that in the new social environment, we can uh, connect almost psychically here on Zoom. 
I also want uh, our two special guests uh, on the panel to say hello. Uh, Julia Tulovsky, can you say hi from your perch at the Zimmerly Museum? Hello. In and then Olga Zykina is an expert in Moscow conceptualism. She's also one of my teachers at Hunter, and she's taking part in the organization of the second generation Moscow conceptualist show. And I'd love for her to say hello. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. Yes, wonderful. And I also see uh, another teacher who's helping organize that show in the audience, Daniel Boshkov. Hi, Daniel. And Yuri Albert is here, and he is a second generation Moscow conceptualist. He's going to be on the show. Yuri, where are you? Hey. Hi, Yuri. Where is he? You've, you've got to find him. There are hundreds of people here to see you, oh, but he's oh. in there. I can see him. Oh. Hello, Yura. Hi. And he, he has, actually has uh, wonderful interviews of both Vitaly and Alex in the catalog for the show. Um, the show is called A Lesson in History, and I think that's a wonderful name for the show because these are preternaturally historically aware artists, and with humor and humanity they weave history into their work and with that i think i'd like to begin by asking julia to explain the inception of the show that is up now at the zimmerly through june which i urge you all to go see after we finish this talk so julia can you tell us how the show came together oh yes absolutely well i wanted to uh, to do the show for comrade melamid for a long time because uh, at the Zimmerly, we have um, a great and wonderful collection of um, non Soviet nonconformist art or underground art that was produced in the Soviet Union. Basically, everything but the socialist realism. So, all the most uh, radical movements and most radical artists we represent. And the collection is over 20,000 pieces. And Komar and Milamid is um, one of uh, my fellow critics uh, uh, and uh, curators, Andrei Yerofeyev, uh, pointed out are the generalissimuses of uh, uh, Soviet nonconformist and underground art and uh, uh, Russian art in particular in general, because uh, uh, if one judges by the influence that the, uh, the work um, that had on other uh, artists, and uh, that includes uh, uh, artists of uh, in Russia and also internationally. So that was an absolutely obvious choice, a kind of a must do exhibition. And uh, um, I was thinking about it uh, uh, for a long time uh, and it had a different title, but of course um, it had to be rethought after the uh, invasion uh, of um, uh, uh, Russian Federation to Ukraine, and um, um, it be, it made the material, the the art of Komar and Melamid, much more relevant to uh, today's situation. And the, uh, as you said, um, Johnny, uh, the history um, is repeating itself. And uh, I think that um, the exhibition is called Lesson in History, and it provides the lesson of how to, many lessons actually, of how to deal with um, totalitarian environment, with uh, uh, art environment, with uh, changing countries. So, so it, I think it's a very um, diverse and vibrant material, uh, which I was very privileged to work on and very happy to present it to the public. Thank you. Now, Olga, um, as our academic expert in Moscow conceptualism, could you give a brief overview of what we call Moscow conceptualism, the movement that Homar and Melamed intentionally or unintentionally really helped to set off um, in the 70s in Moscow? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, I first want to thank the Brooklyn Rails uh, team for organizing this event and for having me here. I'm very excited to be part of the discussion today. And um, 
yeah, this is uh, an important question. Moscow conceptualism is an important underground movement that emerged in the late Soviet Union um, in the early 1970s. And it's important to, to know that the non-conformist art had a longer uh, history. It um, you know, um, emerged in the period of Tho in the 1950s and 60s. It was very important, but um, there was an important event, several events, but one of them was uh, the so-called bulldozer show in the 1974 when um, non-conformist artists, the dissident artists, gathered in a public field in Moscow and showed their work to the public in, uh, you know, attempt to find the broader audience for their art. And that show was um, brutally dismantled uh, with a huge police force and bulldozers and water cannons, and that's how the name came up to the show, the bulldozer show. Um, and uh, that uh, uh, event became a kind of um, an important uh, place in the history of unofficial, Soviet unofficial art, when the new generation of artists decided not to search for public attention and kind of go into the underground and um, use the uh, ideological, uh, language as a tool to undo the ideological canons and cliches of official culture. And that's how the new generation of Moscow conceptualists, Moscow unofficial arts came up to the scene, the artistic scene. Um, and Comer and Melamed uh, are also known as inventors of Sots art, which is um, a kind of a branch of Moscow conceptualism. And Sots art is a play on words. It's an amalgam of um, com combining the uh, socialist realism and pop art. And it uh, kind of pl played with and satirized the um, stereotypes and canons of socialist realism in the way pop art kind of undermined the cliches of American consumer culture. So, um, and of course, uh, uh, Comer and Melamed had their students, um, one of whom we see, we also have today, Yuri Albert, uh, and the range of artists who were uh, working with uh, Comer and Melamed uh, later in the 70s and um, 80s, also even after Comer and Melamed immigrated to the United States. So this is like a brief um, yes. overview of what happened. Thank you so much. We're gonna open the floodgates on the art in just a second. But first I wanted to ask Vitaly and Alex for our first lesson in history from each of them. And I wanna start with Vitaly. Um, can you just describe the moment in history into which you were born and grew up and were trained as an artist leading up to the bulldozer show perhaps in 74 or leading up to meeting uh, Alex and starting to work together a few years before that. What was the visual environment like for you growing up in the Soviet Union born as a World War II baby? Yes, I was born in 43. Uh, uh, the war all, all, already uh, st start to move to um, East European part. Uh, Russian part was uh, with, um, <clears throat> finally free. Uh, and my uh, parents was uh, uh, in, um, in army. Uh, uh, as a military lawyers, uh, and um, they returned in 1943 uh, to Moscow. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and I was surrounded, uh, um, I was living with, uh, uh, in 1945, they were sent again to uh, Germany as a military lawyers. Uh, and I was growing with my grandmother and grandfather. Um, it was a shock for me, I believe, because separation from the, um, my parents, from mother particularly. 
Uh, and um, I stopped to speak. For two years, I didn't speak. I started to speak freely before they left me. And also at 1945, when they turned back from Berlin. Uh, <clears throat> and my grandfather and grandmother uh, uh, was growing with uh, Jewish tradition as mother, as my mother as well. And father was Ukrainian, growing in family with um, Polish origin, uh, Ukrainian, uh, who was growing in Christian tradition. Uh, that Is he frozen? Seems like he's frozen just a second. We'll give him one second to see if it gets back online. Um, Alex. Yes. Maybe, maybe you can um, continue the thread. What was the visual environment What it, for you growing up? What did art mean? What introduced you to the idea of art in your life? Uh, my grandmother, uh, my grandfather was. Oh wait, Vitaly's back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You ask not me. Sorry. You ask Alex. Oh well, I uh, I want we want to hear from both of you. So. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So the question is, what did art mean? How did how were you introduced to the concept of art? How did you become an artist? And we're sort of building up to the Sotz art explosion. Uh, as I said, the first example of conceptualism, official conceptual art created by early Russian avant-garde, I mean, uh, slogans, uh, <clears throat> which replaced the commercials of the pre-revolutionary Russia on the street. Uh, it was a um, kind of, uh, for example, thank you to comrade Stalin for our happy childhood. It was a first, conceptual art, which I saw. Uh, it was quite ephemeral art because uh, meaning of slogans sometimes change. Uh, also, uh, sometimes um, Russian winter and uh, rain and snow and um, all slogans was replaced by new one. It, a, lot, a lot of works for artists. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, to make uh, Moscow as a capital uh, more powerful. In Russian language, uh, red is mean beautiful. It's the same. Krasna Devitsa. Red woman, red girl, it's mean beautiful girl. Um, krasno Prekrasno. Uh, that was maybe one of the reasons why Bolsheviks uh, succeed to, <clears throat> uh, to make uh, their revolution. Uh, anyway, uh, at home, I saw quite different art. Uh, my uh, grandfather collected books uh, about art, some of them pre-revolutionary books, which was a source of the alternative thoughts for me. Uh, <clears throat> we had uh, some paintings in our house. Uh, in our house, For example, uh, we had a Shishkin. Uh, it's a very famous Russian uh, uh, artist, painter, landscape painter. I must have sold him uh, before I immigrated because I was needing money and my grandfather passed away at this time. <clears throat> um, and so kind of kind of art, yes. I'm gonna stop you there. Alex, what would your answer be? Uh, how, how would you describe your visual environment growing up in the USSR under Stalin? Oh dear, uh, you know what, I, I don't remember really. I mean, I can only project it and now, uh, I mean, on the other hand, every remembrance is a fake remembrance. But anyway, so uh, what I, you know, analyzing my uh, uh, past, uh, I think uh, we were born in, the, um, in a time of new avant-garde, you know, uh, so this uh, the uh, the beginning of the 20th century, which was not far away. I was born in 45, so the revolution happened 
uh, practically 1920s was I was 25 only years away from uh, the Russian Revolution, but uh, and all this, uh, you know, I live in a frenzy of new uh, uh, new avant-garde, same way as the Americans uh, did at the same age, at the same age here in the United States, mostly in New York, of course. So that was a new new avant-garde after destruction after the destruction of the World War II. And now thinking back to that, uh, uh, I, I thought that I saw these people totally obsessed by art, like they, you know, early Christian sects, uh, totally devoted to art. And each artist had the group of followers, not every artist, but some artists. So there were the saints, uh, there were uh, the leaders of this new movement, you know, which was, uh, constructed, made up uh, many, many small different groups all across the country. And they were really passionate believers in art. So I realized that art is the religion. It's a passionate faith and something. But now looking backward, I mean, looking now, I understood that mm, more and more what uh, a Russian philosopher of 19th century said, we think we're the doctors but we are the disease. I realized this, all the calamities and the worst of events that had happened in the 20th century, the responsibility is, uh, should be uh, of art. So art is the reason for what has happened in the, uh, uh, what had happened in the 20th century. And fascism, Stalinism is, uh, parts of this um, uh, of the art modernism. You see this and uh, you have to understand it very, uh, very. Now, the, uh, of course, this uh, function of art has changed. And I want to uh, read you uh, a quote from Gerhard Richter. He, he's quite, uh, he's a, quite a successful artist as far as I understand. And he says it about the art now. Art is a wretched, cynical, stupid, helpless, confusing, a mirror image of our own spiritual impoverishment, impoverishment, our state of forsakenness and loss. We have lost the great ideas, the utopias. We have lost all faith, everything that creates meaning. So you're your uh, description of a Russia that was teeming with hope uh, and faith in art is a description of Russia in the thaw when it became possible to. Well, it was before. It's the same. It was at this. Uh, the processes, the world processes, were the same everywhere. What. Uh, Jackson Pollock was doing, you know, in America in the late 40s uh, and the 50s was done in Russia a little bit later, maybe in the late 50s or mid 50s. But it's the same thing, you know, we think about different things separate from uh, the world. Uh, right. Russia, yeah, yeah, part it... of the world, the world moves in the same direction. You see, it's not. Uh, you know, you saw not Stalin, but uh, Coca-Cola uh, advertising or some other slogans, but in principle, they were the same. So it's not Russia specifically, it's Russia as a part of the world. Right, so we're talking about people trying to heal from the trauma of World War II. And, and the trauma of the that mass slaughter they witnessed. Of communism. Yeah. We're all was traumatized but our environment. Right. And so in this environment of people trying by one means in the nonconformist movement to heal and to resist and to push for more freedom after the thaw from Stalinism, you and Vitaly started making this work that appropriated the trappings of communist sloganeering. And can you just 
give us a lesson in history. What was your headspace? What was your mind frame in making this work at the time? Exactly what, uh, what uh, uh, I don't know, Russian, I mean, American pop artists, or I mean, they were not called pop artists yet, but uh, the, the same intention, exactly the same. I think you cannot take us out of the world and bring into Russia because Russia is is the world as much right. as America is. You see. There right. Is no to draw place. attention to the disquieting uh, totalitarianism of the environment, whether Russian or American. Exactly, because those American artists were fighting uh, like, uh, the system they lived in. You know, it was the McCarthy era. It was the era of era of uh, a partisan review magazine. Uh, and uh, stuff like that. So uh, that right. was a very unsettled time, you know, and people were trying to find an exit from that into this bright and amazing future, to the second coming, to, uh, to the end of the world. You know? That's very interesting that uh, a great American critic, uh, uh, Harold Rosenberg, called uh, American abstract, abstract art uh, apocalyptic wallpaper and it's very true because that was the uh, because it was apocalyptic because people are waiting for the uh, uh, nuclear war and uh, they still haven't reco hadn't recovered from uh, the World War II but unfortunately when apocalypse uh, went away uh, American art is just the wallpapers uh, with no apocalypse in it the same happened to a Russian art, you know. But thank, thank God, uh, Putin invaded Ukraine, and now uh, it's kind of you know apocalyptic uh, feelings are uh, 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 getting in, and our art is still an apocalyptic wallpaper, you know, which is I mean not still, but just became right now, which is really great. Definitely, I mean, right. I think I think what you're pointing to is. The fact that we're all embedded in these power relations, uh, in this struggle for survival, and we displace our hope for redemption from religion to art, hoping that somehow by occupying ourselves with this creative work, we can forestall our doom or bring on our redemption. No, I think uh, that's what was uh, happening, that we, our personal beliefs, we try to impose on the world and, and to make it a truly Catholic uh, 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 faith. Uh, so now modern art is Catholic, you see? It's not a, 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 the small sex fighting each other. It's just the universal. Catholic means universal, yeah. Right, the modern art, the modern art establishment has this this totalitarian power. Certainly, but... I think we, we we can call a new movement, a new what's going on, not postmodernism, but Catholicism. That's that's the world we live in, and we, in a way, we are, you know, uh, uh, the sect the sectants or heretics. We became uh, just Catholics, you know. Uh, a Catholic priests or whatever, you know, something right. like Julia, Julia had something to say. Yes, I also wanted to, uh, you know, to address um, uh, a question to Vitaly following up on the um, conversation, uh, because my understanding uh, is that you were the very first who actually um, um, introduced the slogans uh, and kind of expropriated them for your art and uh, deconstructed them in a certain way. You signed them the name to them, etc. And by doing that, you combine this official sacred uh, realm that was uh, they, that they had status of a really um, almost religious objects in, during the communist regime. And uh, you uh, brought them down to the uh, everyday life, so to speak. Am I correct in this uh, supposition? Or, uh, uh, or how did it happen that you started uh, use uh, Soviet propaganda in your art and you know, mock it, paradise, uh, uh, you know, make par parody on it? And what did it mean for you? 
Kung to uh, you address your question. Vitaly, you, you Vitaly. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I start to um, think about art when I remember my first ch child ch children dream. Uh, I think the origin of art inside of human minds, because uh, from my point of view, uh, our dreams, our visual impressions, uh, I mean, night dreams, of course, what we see as a, our dream uh, in our mind. Uh, it's a kind of alternative reality. Uh, and it's very attractive. And it's a kind of, kind of drug for our mind. Uh, and I think that's origin of the art in our dreams. And um, now, uh, the Freud and uh, Jung, as a psychologist, not so popular, but I believe there was very close to very simple explanation of origin of art. Uh, it's an attempt to fix, fixate, to make it a more or less uh, long-lived uh, phenomenon. Uh, and um, letters, alphabet, was born as a development of kind of hieroglyph of characters of ancient Egypt and even drawings in ancient um, stone age on the, in the walls of the caves. It's a difficult to say it's a story or it's art. Uh, it's a something at the same time at both. It's an attempt to depict something happened, for example, the, the mise-en-scene of the hunting for the animals, or its description of the hunting. Uh, in Russia, in Russian language, uh, thanks to um, Greek uh, connections, Zhivapisets, uh, <clears throat> artist, painter, also is something who is writing. It's a, uh, it's a kind of not just because writing was also with uh, help of brush as a, in Chinese tradition of hieroglyph, for example. It's a very difficult to separate depiction of the character. For example, in Hebrew, each form, visual form of character of the letter, each letter has a lot of symbolic explanation, even, even it means the, even numbers. It's difficult to separate the characters, slogan, and visual art. For me, it's for me, my personal problem. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, my wife, she's a, a poet, a, a psychologist, and uh, making a lot of translation from one language to another. Uh, and I tell you that even the most difficult Russian artist, uh, poets, impossible to translate in English, more or less uh, similar. Uh, and when we're speaking about art, we try to translate visual language to verbal language. It's almost impossible, even more difficult than translate poetry from one language to another. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for example, Vasari, who was one of the founder of such a translation from visual art, uh, he mm, replaced description of the art itself by some anecdotic details of the biography of the artist, etc. Because it must be something about what, about what we're speaking. That's a big, it's important thing that's our understanding of beauty in art and beauty in nature, absolutely difficult, absolutely different, sorry. Sorry, my English, difference, different because Beauty in nature without historical context. It could be beauty of abstract clouds on the sky as an abstract art with no connection with what's happened for this terrible life in, uh, on the, our earth or beautiful life. Sky is not change. But 
beauty of art always in historical connection or in historical context, even better to say in historical connotation. Uh, and that's a, one of the reasons why we met if you invented artist, for example, uh, <clears throat> um, Buchumov and Diablov, uh, is a, uh, we call it legends. It's a not existed artist or existed only partly as a name, etc. Uh, it was a parody on two most important superstitions of art lovers. First, good artist must be recognized stylistically or visually from first point of view. We created artists who lost eye. If you close your eye, you see the nose. And he starts to depict in his painting his nose. If you see the nose, that's the Buchumov. Another superstition, good artist must to discover something new in art. And we create another artist, abstract artist of 18th century. His dark varnished and in crack, in cracks painting always has a date, 18th century. It's the abstract art of 18th century. It's another parody, parody on the uh, second most important superstition oh, of yeah, artists yeah. and art lovers. That's, uh, I believe, for me personally, it was very important. It's, a, it's no difference in our dream, no difference between legend, between existent artist or not existent artist. We see such a realization of a dream. That's why I love conceptual art. I love Marcel Duchamp. But, my, uh, but I am always really love uh, Marc Chagall because he was most closely artist to the idea of dreams from my point of view. Well, and I, I, I don't like his appearance. Uh, my, uh, my cat was uh, 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 throwing up. I was cleaning after my cat. Oh, God. Have to be, I've excused, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, it's always somehow connected to art. It really is. I mean, there's this, I, I love that you talk about uh, finding inspiration in dreams and the worthwhileness of pursuing the impulse to share an idea and tell a story to the point of fabricating a fictional person, if that's what it takes to make the point, because I think that's what's so powerful about your work. It has a, a prophetic uh, quality in both senses of the word in English. It has this satirical, um, judgmental, historically informed sort of righteous harangue of the people around you and commentary on life, which is what the prophets in the Bible do. But it also has a future predicting quality which is the other sense of prophecy in English, such that even this fictional character you made, Apelle Ziablov, to criticize the notion that artists have to aspire to be so momentous as to invent new techniques, in certain ways prefigured the way that your work was received outside of Russia by people who wondered how you created how how you invented conceptual art and all these other genres and techniques when in their perhaps blinkered view you were incarcerated behind the iron curtain and you were you were attending tending to the cat alex but vitali was saying um, that really it's just a matter of using your imagination implementing what you know and spinning up the idea and that i think is something that the i, I disagree with that I, 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 I disagreed with that you know com uh, uh, completely you know i think it's uh, uh art uh, at least as i see it nowadays is just a phony religion you know, which uh, is responsible for a lot of atrocities as i said already you know like uh, Christianity was responsible for many atrocities. There's a, some debate that art brings something good 
but I don't see any good, actually. I, I, I never asked people, you know, what is good about art, and nobody could explain to me clearly, you know. It's all ref, uh, referred to some unknown forces of uh, something which is called spirituality, but nobody could explain to me what spirituality is. And all this Marxist analysis or Freudian analysis of art uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, explain uh, anything actually in art, you know. And I said, it's exactly like a, a religious thing, you know. And now it's a really a uh, force, uh, uh, the most reactionary force possible, you know, because it's uh, anti-enlightenment uh, force. So uh, uh, people refer to the total mindlessness and a uh, cult of mindlessness. And, but uh, and again, to some uh, inner forces, which I suppose don't exist, or maybe they do, but I want but to... But isn't making art to the level of realization that you and Vitaly did with such persistence? No, I can call it... Uh, doesn't, I, doesn't it... Well, 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 the, well, the term, I call it derision. We hated art. We were cynical about that, as, as I understand it now. I mean, I, I don't want to impose my ideas of anyone, but it was anti-art because I think art is, is a menace and danger. And my hope that maybe artificial intelligence, something like that will stop this insanity. I'm not saying that it should be eliminated or something like that, but it should be squeezed into a small uh, a group of people. Now everyone is an artist. There's a billions of dollars spent on this nonsense. You know, uh, there's a... Uh, it's 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 insane, you know, insane. And now this uh, uh, countries which were outside of the European idea of art, like China and stuff like that, came in, and there's a millions of spiritualists, millions and hundreds of millions of people who something do, you know, just uh, dirty canvases, and then they say we're artists and we represent something which doesn't exist you see that's 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 it and it's not the first time for I mean, in history you know a human mind and human uh of uh, power uh, went into a total dead end that was uh that what happened to this uh, here here are, here are two of your predictions from the 70s in your scenes from the future series of a bombed out Guggenheim and a bombed out MoMA reclaimed by nature. Vanity, right. vanities, all is vanity. Oh, absolutely. Lonely uh, can uh, stretch uh, far uh, away. Uh, look at Guggen Guggenheim. It's a totally nonsensical building. You know? Absolutely nonsense. So, Some claim that it's pretty or beautiful. I don't see it. Maybe it is, but uh, uh, I don't know what is beautiful, you know. And then... Uh, there is a total nonsensical pieces of uh, a guy who was a theologist and spiritualist and a total idiot, uh, uh, Kandinsky represent, uh, represented. Have you ever read Kandinsky's pieces, you know, about spirituality? And oh, yes. It's, 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 it's absolute twaddle, it's yes. It's the demise of a human mind. It's so idiotic. That. Kandinsky, uh, oh, Kandinsky. Adam Blavatsky, of course. I mean, of course. What are you saying, Omar? Uh, I think uh, I think Kandinsky never speak about vanity. Vanity is not dangerous. The idea of vanity is not dangerous. It's a different different story. I don't know. It's, it's really we we cherished, you know, before we left Russia, uh, and uh, we realized that we couldn't take any work with us. Uh, mm, uh, uh, to uh, to the west uh, uh, to the place of our immigration and we were not sure where we were going to uh, settle uh, so uh, uh, i was sitting in this uh, uh, big library in moscow and reading uh, uh, malevich's uh, uh, I mean, writing it's i mean uh, uh, the whole art is just how low the human mind can go you know? If we'll put, you know, Schrodinger on one, uh, one side and uh, Malevich on the other side, we see the uh, uh, possibilities of human mind, you know, from uh, the great mind of uh, Erwin Schrodinger to absolutely 
mindlessness of, of, of stupidity of, of, of uh, uh, Malevich. It's uh, so clear, you know. Some people say, oh, stupidity is good, but like in uh, Trump, you know, I mean, Trump is stupid and he is a great hero, you know. So it's a direct link, link between Malevich and uh, Donald Trump. I'm sorry to say that, but that's true. Oh, absolutely. And here we're talking about we're talking about destructive forces and artists of destruction. But I would argue, and I love your brilliant performance of the curmudgeon, that you and Vitali represent a productive force and a constructive, a truly constructive, not constructivist, because you're anti all isms, but a truly constructive force in art. But and again, it's anti-art. Look at this uh, uh, poster you, you see on, on, on screen, you know. It's, it's us, uh, uh, very young, obviously. And we think, you know, uh, if you don't believe in anything, believe in us. We think of you, you know. It's a parody of uh, art as religion. Or not parody, just a, a, a explanation. Right, but it's a parody uh, so good that it turns in on itself and it, it helped create a, a thousand artists. I mean, this is why you developed this. I, I feel really sorry for that, but I hope that uh, this uh, art insanity will stop uh, and uh, uh, rather sooner than later. I'm too old, of course, to witness that, but uh, maybe from uh, uh, above. And I'm, uh, I'm I mean, the only thing that will go up directly up. Art is sane art, the sublimely, in, the sublimely sane art that you and Vitaly modeled for us and future generations yet. Yeah. What do you, what do you, what would you like to say, Vitaly? Uh, I just to, uh, like to say that uh, many of these uh, posters, black and white posters represent self irony. And i never took it seriously. It was a irony about myself, about right. pretension of pretension of to be leader. Right, which is the most important tenet of sanity in life and sanity in history is to have the irony about yourself to know that you shouldn't form some kind of cult of personality and attempt to create some kind of utopia that is guaranteed to end in tears, but you should just work on the poster and make the poster good enough to get a laugh. Okay, Olga, what would you like to say? Yeah, I'd like to jump in if you don't mind and yes, uh, follow up on uh, Vitaly's earlier comment and Alex uh, about the conditions that uh, kind of force us to see art in a certain way and, you know, develop our criteria to approach art. Um, so, uh, and, and, and go back to the exhibition as well. So soon after the exhibition opened, uh, Zimmerle Museum organized an event during which one of the performances, which originally took place in Moscow in 1974, was reenacted. And I'm talking about the project um, called Art Belongs to People, uh, which was a parody on the Soviet state system of control of art production. So in the original performance uh, in Moscow in 1974, Four, three people with no art background were directed by Komar and Melamed to represent some subjects from the official newspaper. And in Moscow, I believe it was some kind of a report from a, a power plant uh, in Belarus. And then uh, a decade later in New York, it was again a newspaper report about Ronald Reagan's assassination attempt. And this time a few people again, with no art background, and I believe there were immigrants as well, were to represent the, this scene, uh, this news about uh, Ronald Reagan's assassination attempt. And uh, during the, the, the performance was guided by Comer and Melamed, and if the participants made any mistake, quote unquote, Comer and Melamed would stop them so that the audience could discuss what went wrong and how offensive the mistake was. And so originally in Moscow, the performance was, um, the performance parodied the Soviet art production system with its uh, humiliating experience when the government would intervene into the process of art making by producing reviews with comments and suggestions on how to make art. 
And so the idea of art belongs to people, art belonging to people, which was the official slogan of Soviet ideology, was a complete myth, an artificial construct. And this project was brilliant in revealing the fairy tale of this myth of art belonging to people. And my question is to both Vitaly and Alex, what was your experience of recreating it in New York a decade later in New York, at this place of artistic freedom, this mecca of, of all artists willing to express their artistic ideas the way uh, they see them to be as free as they want. Is to make money. To make money. That's what people, uh, uh, artists, are, uh, care about the most, you know. Come to New York to be rich and famous. Right. You know, but it's interesting in the social surrealist environment and here, uh, art uh, 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 came up to the same uh, American abstract expressionism, you know. So all roads lead to American abstract expressionism, you know. But actually, this was not the first performance in Moscow in 1974 because the first performances uh, uh, were done in 1883 in in uh, Paris when the people who couldn't uh, uh, never uh, painted and never. Uh, never made drawings or anything, but uh, uh, having a show of their uh, art. Unfortunately, nothing is left, but as far, as far as I understand, they were the first abstract expressionists ever. Mm. The, uh, and, and what do you think about the recent reenactment of it in the Zimmerli? How did the audience react to your instructions in these uh, three different instances and in the similarly in particular, how did you feel about your instructive role, didactic interventions back then? Uh, in about the that, you know, it's just because now everyone with a clear consciousness got, could say, oh, the result is so beautiful, so nice. We got used to this, you know, there's no controversy anymore. It's so beautiful. <laughs> they painted the whole wall and two huge canvases charming amazing beautiful that's the result you see and whatever you do it's charming amazing beautiful ah i i have to say that it was a lot of fun and uh, you know alex and vitaly were giving instructions and alex told the participants that you have to paint from your gut and they were came out there in front of the canvases and really did this very energetic painting and uh, it was it, it had that this whole action had quite a quite a bit of energy but the result the result it's beautiful the result is amazing amazing, amazing no? i mean great I yes mean, that's, that's absolutely amazing that's it that's that's the, a bottom line so this, have we uh, finally reached the point of uh, uh history of art when art really belongs to people now? I mean, to a public, of course, you know, I mean, I mean, to some rich people, I suppose. <laughs> but to some people, definitely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, uh, look at this art fair, you know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of beautiful, amazing, amazing works, you know, just magnificent works. That's, that's the bottom line, a lot of beauty and magnificent uh, uh, it just uh, is produced uh, every day in every second. Alec, you also mentioned that you think, think that art and you know modernist art is responsible for the uh, happenings and the atrocities and whatnot and of the history. And uh, in this respect, I wanted you to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on how the spirituality did this and also uh, you know there is an opinion that your own art uh, with uh, Vitaly uh, really parodied and opened up the way to parody the system and uh, opened up people's mind to really um, deconstruct it to to mock it and uh, which contributed greatly to to its eventual demise because people's minds uh, were uh, was, were ready for that. So, uh, can you comment on these two things, please? Uh, you're asking me, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, and 
Yeah, no, I, you know, there's a, the 20th century was built, uh, and we still live in the 20th century to some degree, uh, on three kind of pillars. Uh, it was uh, Marxism, and uh, everyone who's someone was a Marxist uh, uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and uh, uh, 60s, and even the 70s, I, I, I saw this real Marxist here. Uh, and it still continue. Then uh, Freudianism, and everyone was a Freudian, a Freudian uh, here in New York in 1978, as far as I can tell. Uh, um, uh, when I came here, uh, uh, everyone went to a shrink uh, at least once a week, but mostly twice or three times a week. And modernism. Uh, so this was the three destructive uh, powers, you know, which defined the 20th century with all this stuff. Because you have to understand, modern art, uh, mo modern art, modernism, let's say, became uh, has become associated with uh, 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 left, uh, with the left, with Marxism, with uh, uh, the Soviet communism. But it happened absolutely accidentally, uh, because uh, after the Russian Revolution, uh, the only people who agreed to cooperate with this uh, new government were the modernists. Who said yes? Of course, we're always uh, uh, for uh, for the revolution. We for a revolution. Uh, it's a revolution is ours, and we. Uh, I mean, we 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 want to collaborate with you. So the rest just uh, 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 disagreed, and uh, so and for uh, some years, not for too long, they were really in charge of everything in art, uh, in the so I mean, in the Soviet Union at that time, but practically in pra I mean. Uh, uh, in essence, uh, art, uh, uh, modern art is much closer to nation socialism than to the Russian version of socialism. Uh, if you, uh, uh, of course, Italian futurism, uh, as it was presented by Sarfati or by uh, Ulysses Evola, uh, uh, all these uh, the theoreticians of, of, of uh, fascism in, in, uh, in Italy, uh, they all were, you know, uh, they all supported and uh, cherished this uh, uh, futurism, Italian futurism. Uh, and, uh, and all these uh, things which went into art and we see uh, from the members of the Theosophical Society like, uh, and followers of Madame Blavatsky, like, uh, uh, as I mentioned, Kandinsky, T.S. Eliot, uh, 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 Mondrian, uh, so this mysticism of there were very close to the ideas of fascism and contradicted uh, uh, the communist ideology. So uh, modernism is, is a more fascism than a communism, much more in its ideological intentions and, and uh, uh, you know, and, and re realization of intention. Uh, on the other hand, my parents uh, uh, wrote the first biography of Hitler in, on, in Russian language. And they were trying to prove in this biography, clandestinely, of course, not directly, that uh, actually there is no much difference between uh, Soviet communism and, and uh, 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 German and Italian fascism. I don't know whether they were right or not, but uh, it seems to me that they were right, actually. So modern yeah. art is a very murky, very, very, yeah, very misty, you know, ideological system, you know, of the superstitions fighting against uh, mind for a uh, mystery of, of the world, you know. Now what Putin says that uh, Ukraine invaded uh, uh, Russia or Putin saying that he doesn't believe that uh, 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 he, that he lost uh, elections, you know, you can say whatever, that was very, uh, mis uh, it's a mystery, you know, so he <laughs> said it, you know, artists said it, and therefore it is true. So it's a totally, uh, and that's what art is. People say, uh, I don't know, Picasso is a great artist. Why is he a great artist? What is the notion, explanation, or what is this about? You're insane guys who believe in this. It's just insanity. We need to stop it.
And do you think that your art uh, contributed to the uh, demise of the Soviet system? No, 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 no. We were never recognized, neither fully, neither by America nor by the Russians. You know, we're totally outside. I mean, at least in our early wars, totally outsiders. Oh, you know, they got interest here because of the Soviet. They did. Oh, oh it's a, look, look at that. Black and white brothers forever. You see, that's the poster we did in 19... Uh, 78 or uh, uh, or 79, I don't remember. Can you show this posters again? I mean, again, please. Yeah. Glory uh, forward to the final victory of capitalism. Huh? Isn't it true? No, go ahead, please. That, that, that black and white brothers forever. That's it. So there's many, many posters like that. So that's... Right. It was, so... it's art. It was not anti-art, but... We said art is a nonsense. You have to stop it. But we were misread because everything was covered by kind of anti, you know, dissident, anti-Soviet, blah, blah, blah. And at that time, anti-Soviet, Sovietism was very popular, just has become very popular in uh, here in, in this uh, uh, intellectual circles of, the, uh, of, of New York. And I met a lot of people at that time. Uh, of this persuasion. Well, well, my answer would be. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so emotional because you know I am at the end of my life, and uh, uh, and Gerhard Richter wrote about this uh, a wretched, cynical, stupid, helpless, confusing uh, what art is, and he is at the end of his life, obviously as well. So it's the wisdom of the old people. Don't forget, we're very old. Woken just like a prophet, relentlessly roasting us to <laughs> make us be better. But it is, you know, it's obvious to me. where we fall short. Look at this uh, Gerhard Richter's work. It's idiot. It's nonsense. Don't you see? It? Right. Yours is better because yours is actually funny and it's actually about something. <laughs> and my answer to Julia's question would be that yes, by relentlessly making fun of these party functionaries and fearlessly doing so, Homar and Melamed did help to hasten the demise of their dictatorship. And now we are at the top of the hour. And so we wanted to open up the floor to some questions from the audience. Um, does anybody have any questions? And yeah. uh, Carolyn, yeah. would you let us know? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so let's see, we have a first question here from uh, Charles Olson. Um, so Charles asks, do artists have any responsibility to society and our political context beyond truth to our own process and vision? Feel free either, Alex or Vitaly. Vitaly. Is he there? I, I, you can see me? You I can, can see me? Yeah, 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 we can see you. Uh, because uh, I had the impression that I uh, disappear from the screen. <laughs> uh, you know, um, uh, I don't know uh, how long I'm going to uh, exist because uh, I am 80, um, a little bit older than Alex, but I'm not so jealous to um, success of another superstitions like uh, um, famous artists, uh, naive um, uh, spectators. Uh, let's, let's leave to everybody how they prefer um, in this case. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, I, still, uh, um, I still enjoy uh, uh, the uh, uh, process of the uh, painting. Uh, I still enjoy uh, the um, uh, <clears throat> time which I can live in this world. Um, enjoy coffee at morning and um, enjoy, uh, as I said, uh, my works. Um, and uh, it's um, I'm more uh, I'm more uh, um, I'm less nervous as. Uh, uh, about uh, something happened around. I understand that uh, something terrible, tragedy, stupid, uh, and even crazy leaders like Putin doing uh, bloody 
crime in Ukraine, and I am doing some works related to these um, uh, things. But uh, I, I believe that everybody have a right to exist, and uh, Ten Commandments uh, limited us. Uh, for example, don't kill anybody. I agree. This is a terrible, terrible uh, sin, uh, and even our post ethic uh, content of contemporary art can't prevent us from such a things. Uh, because we we touch now a lot of <clears throat> a lot of not personal thing. We're speaking about happiness of humankind um, instead of just to speaking about uh, people next of us. Uh, <clears throat> it's very easy to speak about happiness of the world. It's much more difficult uh, to make happy next of you. I think that's a great answer. Um, I just happen to have reached in the slideshow. I just want to share as much art with people as we can. The People's Choice Project, which in one way is a wonderfully cynical satire on the uh, dictatorship of the proletariat of Western capitalism of consumers' preferences as dictated to them by corporations, but it also beautifully illustrates what you just said, which is a kind of humility about really caring about the very quotidian needs of the people around us and caring for the people around us enough to want to know what they think. And this was a, a project where Komar and Melamed told people members of the public in different countries about their preferences as to art and discovered ideal and least ideal uh, configurations of possible paintings for each nation that they conducted these studies in. So this was the ideal painting of Americans and this was the absolute least wanted painting based on their polling process. So even this this difficult problem of whether we should address ourselves to saving the world and what's best for the world or what's best for us and those around us has been canvassed in Komar and Melamed's practice in a wonderfully witty and graspable way, not at all mystical and pretentious and inscrutable. Um, and they're even willing to, they've even been willing to reach a collaborative handout to animals in their history and to not only propose collaborations with beavers and termites, acknowledging the kind of commonalities across species of the desire for a good life, but they actually collaborated with chimpanzees on photography and elephants on painting. This is a result of one of their elephant paintings. So sublimely ridiculous, yes, but also super worthwhile to open up real conversations about issues great and small, which is why uh, these guys are legends and we're so lucky to have them with us to deliver their testimony as primary sources. And we're lucky to have this great retrospective at the Zimmerly Museum, uh, which I urge you all to go see. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, um, or Julia, please go ahead if you have something to add. Hang on, you're just muted, um, one second. Sorry, yes, I'm sorry. I just wanted to uh, follow up on uh, um, John's invitation uh, to, to uh, visit the museum and also to tell that Komar and Melamid collaborated with musicians and in particular composer David Soldier, who wrote music uh, related to their most, uh, to their people's choice uh, project. And uh, uh, there will be performance of least wanted and most wanted music. 
at the Zimmerle on June 18, which, oh, sorry, June 11, which is going to be repeated in Poisson Rouge in New York on June 18th. Uh, but, you know, in, in, the, in the Zimmerle, it will be in the inside of the exhibition, surrounded by art. So that would be a good day to visit. Sounds good. Thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, we have another question here. Uh, Chloe is going to ask on the audience member's behalf. Thanks, Chloe. Hi, everybody. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, the question is from Daniel in the audience. I am thinking of Samuel Beckett's I Can't Go On, I Must Go On. You have developed rejection of art and anti-art into an art practice that you have sustained for many years. Have you thought of following the rejection of art to the fullest and stopping making art or dropping out at any point? Uh, if it's to me, the, what is art? You know, if I make a canvas dirty, is it art or or if I this I just made this? I don't know. Can I, you would call this art or not? Or should I show it in a gallery or a, a Zimmerly museum? Look at that. It's a, it's a beautiful, amazing, truly amazing object. Absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? No? So what is art? You know? what, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, we don't know what we're talking about even uh, uh, saying that. Uh, that. But trust me, we are in a dark uh, corridor. And there's a no light at the end of the tunnel or the corridor, so none. And we're totally messed up. And we, with our artist's help, we messed up the world. You know? And it seems there is no way out, you know, no way out. But maybe there is. Think about this. Daniel Bajkov has a question. Um, yeah, that that was uh, Daniel's question. What what Chloe just read out loud. He has a follow up. He has a follow up. Uh, Wait, you're, you're Daniel. You're muted. One one second. Let's get him unmuted here. Yeah. Thank thank thanks, Alex, for answering. Uh, I meant not what you just made with your hands. Is that art or not? I meant more like a, having an institutional big exhibition at Zimmerman Museum. Mm -hmm. which is a very kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's also a center of a particular kind of art. So I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, because the precedents uh, in art history, like artist Lee Lozano, for instance, who slowly, he had, her final work was like a so-called dropout piece. She literally dropped from the art world, from exactly that institutional justification and, and kind of uh, circulation that your work at the moment is kind of in the center of. So I'm just kind of, wondering if one is to follow the premise, the radical premise of that kind of anti-art, you know, can- uh, no, can the anti -art, it's, it's just denying, it. but, but the problem is, it's not, you know, as an individual, you can do whatever you want. You know, I've done this and some other people can do it as well, but uh, it's not like you stop making art. There's, we need to demolish the art institutions. The art bureaucracy. I'm sorry to say, uh, you, Julia, uh, curator. You know, it's it's an enormous, monstrous. Uh, uh, I mean, animal here. You know, in the room, you know, with all this incredible amount of money all over the world, which are suffocating us. Okay, as an individual, you can do whatever you want. It's not. I mean, it's not. But art is not about individuality. It's about, it's like, uh, you know, communism. It's, it's about the masses were streaming in one direction. I don't know if you ever been to a big show like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Freeze or, you know, or, you know, Documento or, or uh, Venice Biennial. We've been there. Oh, it's a monstrosity. The humanity, it's its worst. And I always ask him, why is it so? Because people, one by one, are nice people, you know? I mean, just really, some of them are really sweet and nice, but together, it's the same, like, what, what you know, from our experience, like a communist party, 
people, you know, through my father, I knew some functionaries of the Communist Party fun functionaries. They were nice people. I mean, okay, but come on. They created a monster, the state. This, I mean, at the same with art, you know, you can do whatever you want. You can, uh, you know, make this stuff, you know, but the institutions, the, the, the monstrosity of this, as I say, suffocates us. We need to get rid of that. And my question was how- Make do you... it individual again. Yeah, and my question was how do you get rid of the, how do you get rid of the institution by fully participating in it? Oh, yeah, it's very easy. You, you, you have to, uh, you have to uh, demolish all tax deductible uh, 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 laws because it's all art is, besides all its sins, is based on fraud, and everyone knows this perfectly well. Okay, everyone knows that. So we need to stop it. In America, it's very easy, and in Europe, we need to. I mean, the government should stop subsidizing. That's not. That's it. But here, it's very easy. As soon as you demolish, I mean, just cancel this uh, the, uh, all this tax deduction. You know, I mean, uh, lanes and uh, streets and and whatever. <laughs> Uh, it will end like that. Alex, can I share the painting from 2018? The end is near. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this is Alex having a proud moment in art making, summing up his message to the institutionalists and the frauds who would try to take art the pleasure of art making away from the individual. I think it's hilarious. His rejoinder to Gustave Courbet, The Origin of the World, The End is Near by Alex Melamed. Hey! Hey! hey. And the, um, the end of our discussion is near, but I leave it up to Carolyn if we want to take a few more audience questions or get to our poetry reading for today. Yeah, um, yeah, th that was, those were the questions for today. Thank you all for asking. Um, and we do have a tradition here at the Rail of Ending with a poetry reading, and I'm thrilled to welcome poet Eugene Ostashevsky here to close today's program. Eugene Ostashevsky was born in 1968 in Leningrad, grew up in New York, and now lives mainly in Berlin. His book, Feeling Sonnets, examines the effects of speaking a non-native language on emotions, parenting, and identity. As a translator of Russian avant-garde literature, Ostashevsky is best known for his Oberu, an anthology of Russian absurdism. Thanks so much, Eugene, for being here today. I'll turn it over to you. Hi, um, thank you very much um, for the introduction and Thank you very much, Vitaly and Alex. I'm going to read a couple of poems from the Feeling Sonnets. Um, sonnet 12. A is for avant-garde. G is also for avant-garde. E is also for avant-garde. E is silent. It has been silenced. It has been silenced by the avant-garde. There's a guard in the avant-garde. It guards the E. The E has been silenced. It is a hard guard. It bears an arm. It is possibly full of ardor. It sits in the A. It stands in the A, it sleeps in the A, it looks over the V, the V is a pen, there is E in it, the E has been silenced, there is a van in the avant-garde, is the van avant-garde, is the van equal to the avant-garde? Is the guard in the van? Is the van before the guard? Is the guard behind the van? Is there E in the van? 
is the van being revved. It is being revved exhaustively. There's no E in the van. T is also in the avant-garde. Is it also silenced? It is differently silenced from E. It is silenced differently. It is silenced guardedly. It is a T. Its silence is guarded. And the second piece, um, I'm going to read. Um, it's called Sovietisches Ehrenmal Tier Garden. And um, in the middle of Berlin in the Tier Garden Park, there's a huge Soviet monument with a giant soldier on the pedestal with uh, two tanks and some artillery to the sides. Uh, the German word hero is der Held, and um, that's a, an important word in this poem. The hero is held. The hero is held over a park. The hero is held over a flame. He is held by fame. Has he a name? No. A hero is held to be a hero. By whom held? Whose hero? He, her hero. Because he has hoes. What hoes are those? Those are some hoes. Has she no hoes? No, he, her hero. Those with no hoes are held. Those with hoes are held. Those with no hoes are held by those with hoes than no hoes. Are they held here? They are held here and there. They are held handily. They are held artfully. Come up, come up and hold my artillery. Thank you for coming. Come again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugene. Thanks for reading today. Um, and thank you so much, Alex, Vitali, and Olga, and Julia, and Johnny for today's conversation. Um, we would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSE program and making these daily conversations possible for their support of our growing archive. You can view today's conversation on our real YouTube channel shortly. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to support, uh, to donate to support the rail. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a poetry reading curated by Courtney Bush. And you can now um, all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank